Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So, thank you all for coming to our series of lunchtime talks in science and mathematics. Uh, my name is Matt Neering. I will be the speaker today, but also would like to remind you that we do have one more lecture this semester. It'll be on Thursday, which I think is December 6th. Um, from Ankur Chattopadhyay from our computer science program, we'll be talking about intelligent surveillance. So normally I do get to introduce the speaker, but as I said, I am the speaker, and the subject today is orbital mechanics. And I guess I would like to provide a little bit of a disclaimer. Some of my students have heard this sort of disclaimer before. Much of what I'm going to say today is incorrect. Okay? I won't tell you when things are incorrect, but much of what I say is going to be incorrect. And it's not because I really like lying to you, but it's because approximations are a lot easier to deal with than reality. So I will have some models that aren't exactly correct, but will hopefully help you visualize uh, different situations of what's going on. So. Given that, uh, we'll start off here, and I'm going to start back in the late 1500s, early 1600s, real briefly, give you some overview of orbital mechanics or celestial mechanics, um, dating back to the days of Johannes Kepler, who you may have heard of in previous science classes of yours, dating or going back to maybe even second grade, um, Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So his first law, he has three of them, and they're really um, more descriptions, I guess, of nature than they really are scientific laws. There used to be a nomenclature for laws and uh, hypotheses and theories and laws and so forth, and um, much of that is really outdated in the sense that we know some of these things really aren't correct, but we still call them laws. So Kepler's law of, first law of planetary motion is that planets orbit the sun in the path in an elliptical path with the sun at one focus. And if you're not familiar with an ellipse, um, perhaps you've seen some children drawing ellipses before. They do this in grade school, where you can take a string of finite length and take two thumbtacks, stick it to a piece of cardboard, um, the two ends of the string some distance apart, and then they stretch out the string with a pencil, and then they draw this around. And really what that boils down to is that they're taking Oops, this, wrong one. They're taking the distance from this focus and this focus and with a string between them. So the, su the sum of the distances from this focus to some point and back to this focus remains constant. The string isn't stretching. And you draw that ellipse out. And it, prior to Kepler coming along, we tried to make it so that the um, our understanding of the solar system was that planets would go around in circles. And he was really able to come along and say, no, it's actually an ellipse. And an ellipse is a special case of a circle where both, both foci are at the same point. The first law isn't of particular importance in terms of uh, the talk today, other than that elliptical shape. The second law of planetary motion that he developed was that a planet sweeps out an equal area in an equal amount of time. So here again, if you have the sun, placed at one focus, right there, and a planet out here tracing around uh, the path of an ellipse. If you take some period of time, it could be one minute, it could be one hour, a day, a month, a year, whatever you would like, for a given planet, it sweeps out an equal amount of area. So you say, all right, let's start our stopwatch right here as it's traversing around, and you stop a month later. And then you shade in all that area, and you compare it to when it is over here by the sun, the same amount of time, you'll see that although it travels a greater distance, the area is actually the same. And I'm going to go through a series of demonstrations here, some animations with a language called vPython that I wrote for the talk. And so I will have to be going back and forth. Bear with me a little bit as I do this. So. <clears throat> This is uh, sort of an animation clip. You can get the same idea by looking at that drawing, but hopefully you get to see a few other features of planetary motion that you wouldn't otherwise see. Now, when we talk about satellites or planets in, um, in our solar system, most of them do not have the shape of an ellipse that is nearly as eccentric or this elongated. They're much closer to be in circles. But Kepler's law, second law of planetary motion says that they sweep out an equal amount of area an equal amount of time. And among other things, what that means is that the speed will change as it goes around, uh, traces out at the path of the ellipse. So what I've done in this, uh, in this demonstration here is that each of these dots that go along here correspond to the same amount of time. So call that a month, call it a week, whatever you would like. It doesn't really matter. It's the same amount of time between dots. And what you hopefully notice is that the dots over here are very closely spaced. The dots on the other side are very, uh, have a much wider distribution. And if you think of the, how that relates to speed, if you go a big distance in some amount of time and compare that to going a smaller distance in the same amount of time, you're talking about speeds there. So there are some other implications of, of Kepler's second law, 
but this is the most obvious one. What I've graphed here, okay, is the distance from the sun in astronomical units. It's not really important what an astronomical unit really is. It's the average distance from the Earth to the sun. But for this particular object here, so it goes from 0 up to 40, and then time along here, you'll notice, goes up to 200 years. But what I want you to see out of that is really this distribution in speeds. So we have those elliptical, area, elliptical orbits, and if I were to mark out that amount of area okay, between four successive dots, for example, over here, we get this small uh, little slice here. And here we have a very narrow wedge, but again, Kepler suggested that the amount of area was equal in those two cases. His third law of planetary motion is a bit more quantitative and allows us to really understand the solar system in a bit more detail. And the idea here is that the ratio of the semi-major axis cubed, okay, so the semi-major axis is this part that's flashing right here. We don't really define the center of an ellipse, but we kind of could, okay? So here's the center of this ellipse, and the distance from there out to the maximum distance away from that center is the semi-major axis, which we've represented here by the variable A, okay? So that distance raised to the third power divided by the period, and the period it's tough to show on a flat screen here, but the period is how long it takes for one complete orbit. And if we square that value, a cubed divided by t squared equals some constant. And for our solar system, that is one, one value for all the planets. Doesn't matter whether you're talking about Jupiter or Earth or Mars or whatever, it's always that same constant. But if you shift systems, say, to Jupiter, which also has some satellites traveling around it, which are governed by the same laws, but Jupiter is a different system than our solar system, that constant would be the same for all of Jupiter's satellites or, plant, or moons orbiting it, but it's a different constant than the constant for the Sun, if that makes any sense. So every time you change systems, the value of that constant will change. <coughs> so what are the implications there? Oops. Wrong one, we just saw that one, number two. Okay, so the third law here tells us something more about the speed of the planets in relation to one another. So this is a pretty simple model. Imagine the orange ball at the center being the sun, and then the yellow and the red balls uh, being different planets orbiting that object. And they're fairly circular orbits. The yellow one is pretty close to a circle, if I recall the simulation, and the red one you may notice is slightly off-center from being a circle. And you hopefully also notice that the speeds of those two planets are different. The one going around the outside, not only is the period longer, okay, but the speed is also, also different. The distance between the yellow dots is larger than the distance between the red dots. And... So... If we look at an equation form here, okay, while this constant is the same for all planets in that system, as you change the distance from the sun, cube that divided by the period squared, this ratio stays constant, which means as you go further out here, you're going to have to have a longer period. So as A gets large, T gets large as well, although it's not a proportional relationship. So we can show a slightly more complicated system here, okay, and all of these simulations, it's really not so much a mathematical simulation as it is a physical simulation using the laws of physics. So you might imagine the sun again being that orange body in the center. We have uh, two planets, the yellow and the red one, and then perhaps we have some other objects with more eccentric orbits. We can change the view of this slightly so that we can see the view edge on, if you will. So take the Earth's plane as being the ecliptic plane there. That would be the yellow one if you wanted to think of it that way. We could have other objects in the, in the solar system that have a different inclination relative to, that, or relative to that original ecliptic plane. And all of those laws, or all of those planets, are still described by Kepler's third law of planetary motion. So, Kepler's laws really are just more descriptive in nature. They say, well, this is what we observe, but they're not really telling you why that that's the case. And it wasn't until Isaac Newton came along in the late 1600s and he developed his, uh, his law of universal gravitation, or the theory of universal gravitation. And this is it in an equation form, and if you've had a class in physics, you may have seen this equation before. 
If you are averse to equations, please don't get up and leave quite yet. It's not going to all be about equations. But to describe this, Newton's law of universal gravitation basically says that every object in the universe is attracted by every other object in the universe. And it's, so it's an attractive force. It's proportional to the masses of each of those objects. So that's represented by M1 and M2. The larger the mass, the stronger that attraction. G, capital G, is the constant of universal gravitation. And it's the same value no matter whether you're talking about the person who's sitting next to you and there's some gravitational attraction, or the attraction between Earth and you, or your attraction between you and the moon, which there is one. So that's, that's just a constant G. And R down here is the distance between those objects, okay? The distance between the centers. And the little arrow here and the little hat here are just telling you the directions that it's an attractive force between the two of them. And any time we have a force in physics that happens to be what's called a conservative force, which isn't particularly important either, but any time we have a force, or a force that is conservative, we give, get rise to what's called potential energy. So when we think of energy, it's a fairly unifying concept in all of, all of science. It uh, doesn't matter whether you're in biology or chemistry, earth science, physics. We all talk about energy. And there's different types of energy. There's energy of motion, which would be kinetic energy. And what we get when we start considering kinetic energy as well as potential energy is there's a balance that's struck between kinetic and potential energy in an isolated system. So I have uh, this system here, it's really just a ball and a track, okay? And if I take this ball and I move it up to one end here, it has a lot of potential energy. And if I let go of it, it starts converting some of that potential energy into kinetic energy. But it gets down to the other side there, okay? And it converts the kinetic energy it has at the bottom back into potential energy as it goes up the other incline there. And it's just a trade-off between those, back and forth. Now this is a real system that is not isolated from the rest of the universe. If you were to close your eyes, you would be able to hear this thing rolling back and forth, which means there is some energy loss in the system, which is why, over time, this thing sort of decays down to zero. It oscillates back and forth. Well, it turns out this is also important in orbital mechanics. And I'm going to show you, um, I'll turn off down the lights here in a moment, I'll show you a demo that I developed regarding the sun. Okay? The model that I have here is that the sun is sitting at the bottom of this cone. Okay? And this sun is attracting all other objects. So you could sort of imagine saying, well, the sun is causing things to roll down the hill of this, of this cone that goes outward. And we can see what happens, why we perhaps get circular orbits as well as elliptical orbits when that is the case. So I will go dim the lights a little bit so you can see this better. So again, keep in mind here that the sun is kind of pulling things down toward the bottom. So, if you were to remove, if I were to remove this plane that's underneath here, okay, and let's imagine we start with just this red ball that's circulating around the top, and I just held it up at the edge of that cone, sort of like I held the ball up at the edge of this track, that ball is just going to roll right down that cone toward the sun, so to speak, okay? But if instead you give it some tangential velocity, it starts swinging around that cone, and it can stay at that level, even if we remove this hypothetical plane here. So I go, no plane, all right, great. And I can sort of move this thing around, and you can look at it from different angles. The idea is that ball just sort of keeps circulating around. But it is also an ideal system. There's no losses there, and that's a good, uh, a good model for planetary systems as well because you really don't have much in the way of energy loss uh, as they travel around the sun. And if you look straight down, it would sort of have that perspective. And let's see if I can get this to uh, come back in here the right way. We want to go, there we go. So if, you, if I spin this piece around, again, we take this cone and I take a plane and I slice through that cone, but at an angle. And what you get out of that is a conic section, which happens to be the shape of an ellipse. And the real question here again would be, all right, let's imagine, could you have this type of system? Again, the sun being at the bottom is attracting the different objects to it, so to speak. And we have a trade-off between kinetic and potential energy. So rather than just giving this ball some initial tangential velocity at just the right velocity to make it go around in a circle, Maybe you give it an upward thrust along this cone, okay, and it starts traveling through this elliptical shape. 
You've perhaps seen this if you've gone to um, any skate parks, whether it's in Denver or a little advertisement for the new Monte Vista Skate Park. They have some nice uh, concrete walls that go up uh, 10 feet. It's this nice smooth surface that goes up and you can go watch skateboarders come along. They get a lot of kinetic energy going horizontal and then they start going, traveling up that wall. And they go up the wall and they slow down until they get to the top and then they sort of curve over and go through a path much like the path of this ball. So this model here is sort of suggesting, well again, if we were to take away the plane of this system, Okay, it's a little hard to see that elliptical shape there, but it is going faster at the bottom than it is at the top, which follows along the lines of follows along the lines of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. It's all governed by Newton's law of universal gravitation. We get this nice elliptical shape out of here. Okay. I guess I can do this from here. Okay, so Newton's law of universal gravitation provides some good mathematics that allows us to describe all types of orbits, whether it's a system where you have four objects in there, whether it's a, um, you're looking at them edge on, whether you're looking at them uh, front, frontwards or from above, any of those systems, they're all described by Newton's law of universal gravitation. And Newton's law of universal gravitation also happens to give us an expression for the velocity of the velocity of a planet. So for a circular orbit, we get an equation that looks like this. And again, there's not too many equations in today's talk, but the idea is the speed or the velocity, V for velocity, equals the gravitational constant G times the mass of the parent object. Okay, so the mass that is there is actually this mass. And the speed is independent of the mass of the object itself. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about this yellow planet or the red planet. The mass of those objects is independent of how fast it needs to be going to do a circular orbit. And it's, it's uh, the radius, the distance from the sun to the, the, to the object or its radial uh, orbit is in the denominator there. And then we take all the square root. Okay, great. So we get this nice handy formula out of here. We can consider some orbital speeds based upon that. So if you think of the International Space Station traveling along, it has an altitude of about 250 miles. And the speed of that, using the equation that we derived there, if it is to stay in orbit, we need a speed of 7,700 meters per second, or about five miles per second. Compare that to our more earthly speeds, whether we're walking at about three or four miles an hour, or whether you're traveling in your, in your, on your bicycle at 30 miles an hour or your car at 100 miles an hour, those are all really low speeds compared to the 7,700 meters per second. That pales in comparison to the Earth's orbit around the Sun, governed by the same processes. We're talking about 30,000 meters per second, okay, or 30, 30 kilometers per second, 18 miles per second, which is fairly high rate. Now, if we want to change the orbits, what we need to do is we need to somehow change the speed. So we're going to talk a little bit about different orbital maneuvers. If you think of satellites, take the International Space Station that we put into orbit. We need to resupply that every so often. So the space shuttle used to go up. We've uh, since decommissioned the space shuttles, but we still have different spacecraft that go visit the space station. And the next model I'm going to show you here has the Earth at the center. Imagine this red, red ball or red uh, circle there as being the space station and the yellow one being a spacecraft that needs to dock with it. Somehow we need to catch up. So obviously we're going to have to change our speed, right? We're going to have to take the yellow one and speed it up to catch up with the red object or catch up with the International Space Station. And the problem here is that, contrary to what you might think, if you want to speed up, you have to slow down. If you want to slow down, first you're going to have to speed up. Doesn't seem to necessarily make a lot of sense to us. Hopefully it will. Oops, I need the escape key here. So this is what is called a phasing maneuver. And I'm going to pause it for a moment over here on the side. So in this system, the blue at the center is meant to represent the Earth again. The yellow is our uh, space shuttle or some other spacecraft trying to catch up with the International Space Station. And to do that, I'm going to let it run around to the other side. And I could launch this uh, maneuver anywhere I like here, but I'm going to do it over on this side. And I'm going to slow down the yellow ball. So the yellow one slows down and it drops into a lower orbit. And as we know from Newton's law of universal gravitation, if you're in a lower orbit, you're going to have to, it'll, it'll automatically start speeding up. The period is lower. So it catches up by first slowing down, which is weird. 
And so to actually then connect with the space station, we have to connect back to that higher orbit. So I have two buttons there. One is drop out of the orbit that you're in, slow down. So what they do is they fire their rockets in the forward direction so that it slows them down. Once you've, connect, once you've gone around and I have it set up to where the period of that orbit, of the new orbit, is basically the same as the period as, of the space station. So it took one orbit for them to connect. Then I had to boost back to the red orbit. So to get back to the red orbit, okay, I needed to jump up and get out there. Well, so what I'm going to do now is let's imagine that these two, uh, these two spacecraft need to decouple from one another. And you don't want them to bump into, you don't want them to bump into one another once they're um, detached. You want one to slow down so that they have plenty of space. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to have this one, the yellow one is going to boost to a higher orbit. So I've hit the boost button, I've, I've given it a um, higher velocity, and what happens, it slows down. So here again, to speed up, you need to first slow down, and to slow down, you're going to have to first speed up, which seems a bit con counterintuitive, counter and I've lost my mouse, there it is. So one of the things that is really important when we're talking about um, man-made spacecraft in particular is fuel efficiency. So launch cost, as you can read there, run upwards of $10,000 per kilogram. So if you think of that, grab your cell phone. It might weigh two, uh, 200 grams, 300 grams. You're talking $2,000 to put it into orbit, okay? which is a lot of money. It's more than your cell phone's worth. So fuel efficiency is really important. And th there's another problem as well, is that if you want to do some orbital maneuver, the larger your object that you're trying to maneuver is, the more fuel it's going to require to do that. Just like if you're driving a semi-trailer semi uh, tr truck down the highway, it probably doesn't have the same fuel efficiency as your little Geo Metro. Okay? It the bigger the object is going to uh, cause you to increase the fuel consumption. And part of the problem with fuel consumption is the more fuel that you need when you're in orbit, that means the more fuel you need to launch, which also means the more mass you need to launch, which means you're going to be paying more. And so it's incredibly important to try and come up with ways to minimize the amount of fuel that you need, but it really is a trade-off of money for time. So back in the 1920s, a uh, German physicist um, by the name of Hohmann proposed some orbital maneuvers that would minimize the amount of fuel that you need. So I'm going to show you a demo here that is meant to represent, say, a mission from Earth to Mars. So we need to go from Earth to Mars with some sort of spacecraft. The red there is meant to represent Mars. Green is going to be Earth. And I apologize, I keep changing my color scheme on these animations. It's because blue doesn't show up on the black background very well at all. So um, where appropriate, green will also represent the Earth. So green is the Earth. The spacecraft is going to be attached to the Earth to start off with. And it's going to try and catch up to or try and rendezvous with Mars, so to speak. Need the escape key again. Okay, so the Earth is going around the sun there. Mars, you can see down on the bottom. I'm going to let this run for a moment. And I could go ahead and launch anytime I like. Okay, so I launched back there. And you notice that I have this little sign to myself that pops up that says, now the Earth to Mars launch window is open. Well, I launched well before the Earth to Mars launch window is open. And you probably have heard of launch windows before, whether it's the space shuttle trying to rendezvous with the space station, or whether it is some probe going from Earth out to Mars. There's a certain amount of time that you have that you can launch that thing into space and still connect with your target. Right here, we're not going to connect with that target. The white spacecraft there is going to miss Mars by quite a long shot. And that's because I wasn't paying attention to the window. So, if I return this, you can see that lo and behold, it crosses that orbit there. That's a bit of a problem. Now, it does pass through the Mars orbit, you will notice, but it continues back to the Earth's orbit. Okay, and then I could come back if I wanted to. I could say, um, let me go do another one here, rerun it. So, I'm going to boost at the appropriate time now, and hopefully, it'll rendezvous with Mars. It takes about nine months for us to send a spacecraft to Mars using this using the, this particular maneuver. So you see Mars and our spacecraft meet up over there 
and if I had the system program for it to stop, great, it would get to land on Mars. And the real problem there is that you do have to plan on spending some time at Mars because you're not going to hit Earth otherwise on your return trajectory. So we could have a return trajectory like this, which is also a home and transfer, and they're going to match up fairly close. And if I return to the Earth trajectory, you notice that the spacecraft is traveling around just behind Earth. We could imagine another phasing maneuver for this spacecraft to then catch up with Earth. But it's going to take some time. It takes nine months to get to Mars using this maneuver. It takes nine months to get back. You're probably going to spend on the order of nine months there. It's a long time. There is one other trajectory, and let me hit a couple here and then I'll talk about it. So I have three boosts built in, or two boosts and a drop built into this one. So Homan suggested another possible trajectory would be the one that I've shown here. So if you watch what I was doing um, in this particular, in the first spot there, the spacecraft separates from the Earth over here. But it has a trajectory that shoots way over this. It wasn't, it's not tangent to the um, path of Mars's orbit like the previous one was. It shoots way out here, okay? And then I had to initiate another boost from here, and that's going to bring it back to the Mars orbit, and then we will be able to drop into the Mars orbit. So I'll continue on with that system. Notice Mars is catching up now because it has a smaller semi-major axis to its elliptical path. Now I drop into the Mars orbit, okay, and I missed it by a little bit, you see, but that's because I wasn't watching very closely. But the idea is these two are, are connected to one another. Now, certain trajectories like this are more efficient than the first Holman transfer. Turns out this one's not even more efficient. This would actually cost us more energy than the previous animation I showed you. For this type of trajectory to be more efficient, this white path over here needs to come out to about 10 or 11 astronomical units. So 10 or, 10 or 11 times as far away from the sun as the Earth is. And if we did that and then launched and then gave it another boost to come back into the Mars orbit, you would actually save energy. You would save the amount of fuel you need. What's the problem with doing that orbit? It's going to take you a long time. Okay? We're going to be talking 10, 12 years okay, for you to uh, go through this particular path and back around. So despite the fact that we really would like to minimize the amount of fuel because launching things into space is really expensive, time is also pretty expensive as well. We probably don't have 11 or 12 years to execute this particular trajectory and consequently save a little bit of money in terms of fuel cost. So we go ahead and spend it in that particular case. Okay, so some other orbital maneuvers you may have heard of before. One common one that we talk about is called a gravitational slingshot. Um, it's probably more commonly in the field called a gravitational assist, but slingshot sounds more fun, so we certainly use that in public a lot more. And the idea behind this is basically a spacecraft that you have is, undergoing, is going to undergo a collision with a planet, so to speak. But not a collision in the sense where two things smash together and are destroyed. Rather, a collision in the sense that there's some interaction, okay? They come together, they come apart. You look at the velocities before and after that collision. And it turns out that in a gravitational assist, you have a spacecraft coming in from down below here. Your planet, say Jupiter, is moving from right to left. So the spacecraft is influenced by the, by the motion or by the gravitational field of Jupiter. And consequently, it starts speeding up, which seems to make sense, right? If you had some planet or some object out here, and here's Jupiter, and you sort of let this planet go, it's going to feel a gravitational force, and it's going to be pulled toward the planet. And if you aim it right, it doesn't have to collide with the planet. It can just sort of skim around the surface. But since that planet also happens to be moving from right to left, that spacecraft gets to steal some of Jupiter's energy. It literally takes energy away from Jupiter. Jupiter slows down in its path around the, around the sun, which doesn't really seem fair. I mean, Jupiter wasn't doing anything there, wasn't doing anything wrong. But nevertheless, this really helps us in the sense that we can pick up some time without ad additional fuel costs. We don't have to launch any extra fuel if we plan things right here. So, this is a graph of the Cassini spacecraft. It was launched in, I think, 1997 or 1998. Um, and was the, the plan was for it to go to Saturn, which is a long way away. 
And it's going to go, and really on this side is speed, it doesn't really matter the value. Here's the speed, and this is time from 1998 out to 2008, so roughly a decade. It was launched, and about six months later, it flew past Venus. So to get to Saturn, we actually launched it toward Venus. And the idea there is that we could steal some of Venus's energy and get closer to Saturn more quickly. So this is the speed. As it goes past Venus, it picks up a lot of speed. It goes cruising past like this, and then it starts going out further on its trajectory. And as, as you go further away from the sun, you start losing speed. Okay? They had a little bit of a, a course correction here, and it's coming back towards Venus again. Picks up a lot more speed again. Flew past the Earth, picks up a lot more speed. Picks up past Jupiter, and I'll show you this is a schematic of the flyby, or the trajectory that it underwent. So it starts off um, right here, launch in 5th, uh, 15th of October 1997. It follows this green path here, goes past Venus uh, one time, okay, goes on the orange trajectory, comes past Venus again, it's picking up speed all the while, comes flying past Earth, picks up more speed, then continues out here, goes, swings past Jupiter and finally gets itself out to Saturn using this gravitational assist process, which helped us save money through the fuel costs, which is nice. So let me show you a demo. Losing my mouse. Not my mind, my mouse. This one goes by pretty quick, so I'm going to stop it here for a moment. This blue object is meant to represent the Earth. Sorry to change color schemes again. So here's the Earth. Green here is going to be the Moon. And then I have some spacecraft, or this could be a near-Earth asteroid, could be any number of things. It's going to undergo a gravitational assist. So these things are going to be orbiting Earth here, but you'll notice in a moment that the yellow one is going to fly by the green one in the right, at the right path and it's going to suddenly change its trajectory. So it comes swinging around the outside here, it gets a boost, undergoes this gravitational assist, and it goes flying off in another direction. And it would continue that, and uh, my animation is going to jump out here soon, okay? What it's doing is the camera's sort of zooming out now so you could get some perspective, okay? So these things are still in orbit around the sun because the sun dominates the universe, or sorry, dom dominates the solar system. But the Earth and the Moon, those blue and green trajectories, just sort of go off in their direction, and this yellow one goes off in another direction. So that's gravitational assist. Okay, now I would like to sh shift a little bit uh, my discussion to topographic maps. So we're all familiar with these. In physics, we largely refer, refer to the lines of uh, elevation as equipotential lines. And we can do the same sort of thing for the solar system. You've all seen these sorts of maps before. Here's a 3D version where this outline in black, here is the 2D version of it. You're looking down, you can read how far, what the elevation is and get some sense of the shape based upon that 2D version. For the solar system, it looks something like this. So I have a big object at the, at the center, which we call the sun. I have a big object over here. We could call that Jupiter. Could be any planet that you care to consider. And then we have lots of lines around here and a couple of labeled points. So those lines are equipotential lines in gravitational space. Okay, It's not physical space in terms of having hard rock. But you can imagine the shape here. So imagine this could be an elevation or a depression. right? It could be a sinkhole. You could have another sinkhole right here. And as you go from one sinkhole over to the other, you have to go through this little pass. Okay, So this would be a saddle point which happens to be an equilibrium point. There's another equilibrium point back here. And these points L1 through L5 are what, what are known as Lagrange points. And they're all equilibrium points at some, at some level. L1 and L2 are unstable equilibrium points, whereas L4 and L5 are stable. And what I mean by that is take this system here. Right now, that ball is in equilibrium. But if I displace it from equilibrium, if I give it a little nudge in one direction or another, it oscillates about that equilibrium location. So it tends to want to be in equilibrium. If you took an egg, okay, and you just laid the egg on its side, it's stationary, it's just sitting there nicely. If you gave it a little tap, it'll sort of wobble back and forth. Okay? When it's laying on its side, that's stable equilibrium. If you take the egg and you balance it on its end, which everyone knows you can do on the equinox, right? 
you balance the egg on its end, okay, and it stays there, and it's a beautiful thing to watch, but if you come along and give it a little tap, it's going to fall right over. It's an unstable equilibrium. So one and two are unstable equilibrium points. We have put spacecraft in those points around Earth, or between Earth and Sun before. The problem is they do require some station keeping. You actually have to do some maneuvering. As it starts sliding off equilibrium, you have to fire some uh, jets or use some fuel, fuel to get it back into place. So... Let me show you a quick demo of some of those. Seem to have lost my place there, but we'll find it. Okay, so in this demonstration I'm modeling the Sun and Jupiter. Jupiter is the red ball, and then we have this other small one, which could be an asteroid that is leading Jupiter um, by some value. And I have a graph over here, and it started off at an angle. So this is the angle between Jupiter and the asteroid. Started off at an angle of about 30 degrees, and you'll notice that, gosh, that angle seems to be changing. And this was one of the weird things about preparing for this talk. I'm writing some code and writing a simulation, and you have to check these things because we all make mistakes. And I'm checking things, and it seemed to have this stable behavior, and I sort of gave this asteroid a little bit of a nudge, and it starts behaving weirdly. It starts getting this really large separation from Jupiter, which is kind of okay. I don't mind that so much, but then suddenly this thing starts turning over, and it starts coming back toward Jupiter. So as you're looking at the angle between here, as measured with the sun at the center, okay, that's what I'm showing on this graph, it went from about 30 degrees up to about 120 degrees away, and now it's coming back, which didn't seem right to me, and sort of made me a little bit worried that I'm just going to have to cancel the talk at some level. <laughs> turns out I don't have to cancel the talk. So it turns out that those things are called tadpole orbits. Okay? Little did I know that I could get the Nobel Prize in physics for this, except I'm you know, um, probably a couple hundred years late for that type of activity. So the idea is I put an object right here at L4 in front of Jupiter, and they're going around the sun, but I put it more like right back here. Well, that spot's not particularly stable. L4 is the only stable spot. But it is kind of like a bowl. If you imagine a marble rolling around in a bowl, hey, it's equilibrium. It can kind of slosh from one side to another. Or if you go back to the Monta Vista Skate Park, there's a nice uh, place they call the Down Under, and the kids go around the side, and they're swooping back and forth like that. Hey, you can do that sort of thing here in space, which is pretty cool. The problem being that it's going to take you a while to slosh around in that bowl. So here's the angle again. So this is just allowing more time to pass. Look at the, year, the time. This is in years, and so down here is 400 years. It takes you about 400, uh, 200 years to go through one of those cycles. But nevertheless, interesting. And if you look at Jupiter and map all the different objects in the solar system out to Jupiter, you get this sort of picture. So here are known planets, and then we have this ring called the asteroid belt, and this is a terrible picture. It's much like the Hollywood versions where if you were to fly a spacecraft through there, you're going to be avoid, you know, constantly in avoidance mode, right? But in fact, there's thousands and thousands of kilometers between these, between these asteroids, so these are um, greatly exaggerated. But the point that I want to bring out here is that Jupiter is sitting right here in this, in this model. There are a bunch of asteroids out here, the Trojans and the Greeks, so Trojan asteroids are asteroids that are in these different locations, sort of chasing, chasing uh, Jupiter around or running from Jupiter, and they're sort of sloshing around in this bucket, so to speak. Okay? And that's why we have this large distribution of them as we go around there. It turns out that in 2010 they discovered the first Earth Trojan asteroid, if you will. So Earth has these Lagrange points as well. So 60 degrees ahead of us in our orbit is a Lagrange point. And looking for objects there, they, hey, lo and behold, found one of them. And it was called, uh, yeah, so they, now they named it 2000, 2010, and I think I have a quick demo of this one. So there's the orbit. And I've exaggerated the scale here from above, okay, so we have a much larger diameters and so forth. But if you took the view from the Earth, what happens with this Trojan asteroid is not only is it sloshing around in a bucket forward and backward, so to speak, it's going above and below the orbital plane as well. So it just sort of oscillates back and forth like this, up and down, and you get this really, if you plot out this trajectory in the right reference frame, you get something that looks like this. And it is a well-understood orbit, but it's also likely chaotic. 
So here is the Earth, here's the asteroid, and then the green lines are sort of where this asteroid goes over a period of time in this frame that you're following the Earth around in. Okay, so it's oscillating in and out of the plane. Really quite an interesting creature. So, another type of orbit that you might find a little bit interesting. Here again, here's the Sun. Um, this could be the Earth, it could be Jupiter, whatever you like. These are called horseshoe orbits. And what happens is that you have some asteroid near one of these Lagrange points, sort of like that previous demo that I showed you. But instead of just oscillating out here and then coming back on the other side, it oscillates around here all the way around, comes around this side, and then flips orbit and goes back the other direction, which seems weird. It's hard to imagine in a flat picture like that what is really happening. And this one I've modeled again with the, um, with the Ju Jupiter and Sun system. So the orange planet there is Jupiter, and we have some asteroid that started off at some distance, uh, maybe 15 degrees away from Jupiter, and it's going through this orbital trajectory. And Jupiter, you'll notice as you travel around here, it's going to come back up and it'll be, it'll be right on the same spot, because Jupiter's a really large object. That asteroid's not going to be displaced by that, uh, or sorry, Jupiter's not going to be displaced by that asteroid. But you'll notice that, um, lo and behold, the angle keeps climbing here. And we're getting pretty close to the mark where that angle between Jupiter and that asteroid is getting to be about 180 degrees. So if you think of that horseshoe orbit there, okay, it's now on the opposite side of Jupiter. Okay, it's swinging around the backside there. And now the angle has turned over again and it's decreasing. But it's decreasing from the backside. Okay, so it's coming along. It got to the maximum of 180. It's swinging around the backside. And I'll try and stop it here just before it goes through its transition to the outside. So it'll take it just a moment. Need to have some music along with this, I guess. Hard to see there, but it's coming uh, pretty close. And. So, now you can see that it's starting to come back in the opposite direction. It had been on these, on these yellow lines. It's starting to move closer to Jupiter. And here, if you think about it, it's getting close to Jupiter. It's going to start feeling that force more strongly, right? The, dis the force is uh, proportional to 1 over the distance squared. So as you get closer, actually, that force starts growing a lot. And so it's accelerating along this line between the two of them. And what happens as you change your speed or accelerate? You increase your speed. What happens to the object then? the period starts to decrease. So as we watch this piece go around, it suddenly jumps outside its original orbit and it starts going back in the other direction. So the angle over here starts increasing. And now it's going to execute this orbit where it's going to lag ever further behind Jupiter and it'll get back to that front side again and then it'll execute that same type of motion. Now. It, it's not just fiction or simulations where you actually see these things. Uh, Saturn has a couple of good examples where the moons are fairly similar sized. With Jupiter and an asteroid, that asteroid's not going to nudge Jupiter very far. But if instead you actually have two objects that are similar size, what happens is they swap orbits. So they go around in these horseshoe orbits and they get to a point where they're really close to one another and whoop, they both jump to the opposite side. So it's like Jupiter jumping, jumping to the inside one and this other one going to the outside. Okay, so, still got a good five, six minutes left, which is perfect here. So, some other interesting orbital features here, some things called quasi-satellites and co-orbitals. So, these are systems that have a one-to-one -one orbital resonance with the parent, so to speak. So, we could take Earth if we wanted to. Earth has a couple of co-orbitals that have been discovered in the last decade. Um, I can't pronounce that first one, Kruine or something like that. You don't pronounce the TH. And then asteroid 2002, which was discovered in 2002, um, AA29. And their orbits look something like this. So you can imagine um, green again being the Earth and red here being one of these asteroids. As long as the, um, the semi-major axis for the one in red is different, okay, so it is more eccentric than Earth's orbit, they can still have the same exact period as the Earth. It's just sort of shifted out there slightly. There's some interesting things that happen in terms of different viewpoints for this. 
So I'll show you two of them. So this is the orbital trajectory of a quasi-satellite or something in a co-orbital. And I had a hard time really coming up with a fine, uh, an excellent definition of both of those terms, so I'm using them probably incorrectly in some similar fashion. But you notice here that it's a one-to-one -one resonance. They have the same period. Now if you were to observe this system from Earth, where it's much closer, this is the orbit that you would see of that object from Earth's perspective. Sort of a bean-shaped orbit. It just sort of lobs around there in space. Because it's this co-orbital frame, it has a one-to-one -one resonance, it seems like a pretty strange orbital path. If we exaggerate the eccentricity a bit more, okay, so stretch out that ellipse of our yellow object here. So I'll let it go around two times here to give you some sense. Okay, it's going much faster when it gets toward Earth over there and much slower out on the outside. So now if you look at this one, it has a weird pattern. It goes through a small loop right here, and then it's going to go through a somewhat larger loop out there. It has a, because it's more of an elongated orbit, it has a, a more bizarre trajectory as viewed from Earth. Now the thing about these quasi-satellites uh, and these co-orbital uh, stations is that these orbits are tend to be unstable. So, so over some period of time, if you have an asteroid of some sort and the Earth, the Earth is eventually going to sort of perturb it out of that stable orbit and it's going to disappear. So we could probably expect that to happen with these two objects that we were looking at in the slide back here. So this is um, the, the predicted path of uh, of Asteroid 2002, and one th cool thing about Asteroid 2002 AA29 is it's actually going to jump in around the Earth, so rather than being a horseshoe orbit where it sort of goes back the other direction, it's going to sort of overtake the Earth, okay, and circle the Earth like this as it goes past the Earth's orbit, which is really bizarre in my book. Okay, so I think the last um, orbital features that I want to talk about here are double stars with planets. So most of the stars in our galaxy are not single stars like our sun is, but they're double stars. And there was a long time, for a long time a question about whether planets could form around such objects. Because the gravitational field is much more complicated when you start talking about two large heavy objects. I mean, in our solar system, things are pretty easy. There's only two objects in our solar system worth any... Um, of any consequence really. The Sun and not Earth but Jupiter. Okay? Everything else is irrelevant for, to a large extent gravitationally. Unless you're really close to one of those like Earth. I mean it's really close to our heart so it's important to us. But it's really of no, really of no consequence in terms of the grander picture of the solar system. But if you take two, two suns, okay, two similarly massed objects, they don't actually orbit like this. Okay? They orbit like this. They orbit their common center of mass. And uh, NASA's Kepler mission is a planet hunter, okay, and it, in 2011 it found a double star with a single planet. So that was pretty cool, the first time we've found a double star system with a stable orbiting planet about it. So not only can you form planets, but there's actually stable orbits about them. 2002, or sorry, 2012, this, this fall, uh, they announced a double star with a, plan with a planetary system. So not only does it have a single planet, but it has multiple planets formed around it. The systems here are much more complex, and I have a fairly simple si uh, simulation drawn for you, and I'm going to run it fairly fast. So I have one sun that is the yellow one, and then another sun-type system here that's about a third the mass, okay? And they're orbiting that common center of mass. So you can sort of see them oscillating around. And then we have a planet out here orbiting both of them. But as you can see, it's not quite as simple as the orbit trajectory that we have uh, our, an understanding of for our solar system. And if you wait here a moment, it's going to turn out that this particular simulation becomes unstable. So I could have said, hey, look at the great job I did. I've simulated things and it's wonderful. It's a stable star system. And it turns out that it's not quite, that orbit is getting further and further out there. <laughs> but it's a much more complicated gravitational system. So you have to have the parameters developed a bit, a bit more correct. And so right now, my planet is disappearing from that particular solar system. It's not, it comes back one more time, I think, and then it's gone forever. There it goes. But it's pretty, it's pretty amazing to me that... When we look at these different mathematical constructs, whether it's horseshoe orbits or whether it's co-orbital systems or whatever, it seems as though every time we sort of imagine 
um, calculating these things in a simulation, somebody goes and looks for it, and lo and behold, there it is in the universe, which is pretty amazing. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you for coming. We're about out of time. I'd be happy to answer a question, but feel free to get up and leave as well.